just kind of talk stuff up. So hope everyone had a good lunch. Um, today I'm going to be talking up technologies that are often talked down. And I'm going to, not going to talk about where they are today or their suitability to purpose um, now. Some of them are still great. Some of them, um, no matter what flack they get, they, you know, and others, well, they have their place in history. Um, most are still widely used, though. And I'm also not going to talk about why people like to talk them down. Uh, instead, we're going to be positive and talk about how did they get to the point where they were popular enough to actually be popularly unpopular. <laughs> to do this, uh, we're going to be traveling back in time. We're traveling back in time uh, to when the web was young and everyone was writing templating libraries. God knows I did. Um, so we're going to start with MySQL 3. Now, MySQL 3 is not the MySQL that we have today. It was an SQL-based network accessible database. It had no transactions, and it had a limited subset of SQL. And, it, and the, the author's stated intent for it was that it should be ideal for storing things like logs um, and other data sets with lots of new rows, high volume inserts. That's what it was originally designed for. And it was great. But before we talk about that, let's talk about like when this time was. So this was 1998. Netscape had just been purchased by AOL. 256 kilobit was still considered broadband. PHP 3 was brand new. And hooking a database up into a website was cutting edge, and people were actually still writing books going, you should give this a try. I know you haven't thought of it before, but you should really put a database back there. And you are a self-taught web developer because that's really the only kind there are. And you need a database for your CGI scripts to talk to because that's how most dynamic websites are made in 1998. And you've used flat files on the server, text files. Uh, there's Berkeley databases, which are you know, a key value store. But, and those work well enough, but they, they fall down once you start to get a lot of requests. And they also mean that you can't scale to multiple machines. And that was always like, that was, that was part of the revolution that made the web, was moving towards platforms where we just add more machines to get more, you know, to scale out further. And it doesn't allow that. Um, because it has to be able to have a shared file between all your web, web requests. And the locking slows it down so that even if you have a really beefy machine, there comes a point where you're serializing all your web requests. It's, it's not going to work. So MySQL was ideal in many ways. Uh, it was freely available to download and try out, although it wasn't actually free software yet. Um, but the license was inexpensive, and they were doing good work. So Place, you know, many places thought it was a fantastic deal. Many places just didn't buy a license, just downloaded it and used it anyway. By contrast, Oracle licensing is prohibitively expensive. Uh, it can cost from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and installation for MySQL is incredibly easy. There's really no setup required to get going. Uh, drivers are already widely available because one of the interesting things that MySQL did is they, they took the protocol of a previous database system and they just used that for their own. And by doing that, you, you know, people had already written those drivers. It was MSQL, incidentally, uh, which I don't think I've ever used. I'm not sure I've ever met anyone who's used it, but it's there. Hey, look, we've got a couple. <laughs> uh, so setting it up is something any sysadmin can do. And that's important because most databases at that time, most big SQL databases, you had to have a database administrator on staff. And if you're a small organization, you can't afford to have somebody whose job it is to just run the database. Especially if you've never had a database before. It doesn't have any established value to your company. And MySQL just works out of the box. I mean, it works to the point where you can you know, uh, just install the package and you're basically done. Um, Oracle, even with a DBA, takes hours to set up. Postgres, which at the time was still PostgreSQL, because you know, they were still going, well, we used to not do SQL, so we need to make it, make it clear. Um, it existed, 
but it was also, it wasn't as out of the box as MySQL was. And that little bit of friction matters when setting up database software isn't actually part of your job. Of course, you still need to learn SQL. But that's not so bad because MySQL had extensive documentation on the web. And even though it was sometimes dry reference material, it also had a user comments section. And the user comments section was like surprisingly fantastic. It had elaborations on examples and some amount of question and answer between users. Probably it worked because the community was small enough that it wasn't totally overwhelmed. But there was this period of time in the web's history where like comments on web pages were a viable form of community. <laughs> as weird as that seems now. Um, and also kind of surprisingly important to MySQL and how it worked for everyone was that it was incredibly fast when it was accepting new connections. And this is not like the area that most databases think they need to worry about. Oracle, like it was an expensive connection time and that meant if you were connecting to it from a CGI script, you might have added a couple of seconds to your latency just to connect to the Oracle database. Um, Postgres was better than Oracle, but it wasn't as fast as MySQL. MySQL's connection times were as fast as HTTP. And that was because most users were using CGI or PHP, both of which have to set up their, had to, at, at that time, both of which had to set up their connections on every request. It made, it was a difference of night and day. Um, So that's really all I have to say about MySQL. MySQL, it was pretty great, and it was a, the database, we needed a database, and it was, it was the database we had. And it's evolved a lot since then. But you have to talk to the database with something. So PHP 3, PHP 3 was also released in 1998. And um, I'm, I'm sure most people know, procedural web-focused scripting language. Uh, primarily found in embedded web servers, uh, embedded in web servers. It was, uh, PHP 3 is the first version of PHP that gained widespread popularity. Didn't have any object orientation yet. Um, and yeah, 1998 again. Uh, servers are super expensive. Smaller websites can't afford their own servers. Virtual servers aren't a thing. The cloud is nothing more than the blob on your network diagram. So you settle for a shared hosting account where your web pages are served by the same web server as other people's services, but there's no separation that virtual hosting gives you. And this was very inexpensive, but running software there was extremely limited. And it was fine as long as you had a static site, which you, know, you could actually get away with, but as soon as you wanted to add dynamism, you probably had to go to CGI scripts. And CGI scripts were often uncomfortably slow. Um, so who are you? Uh, so in this case, we're going to start with if you're working at a web hosting company and your users want dynamic websites. And you've grudgingly let your users use CGI scripts because, you know, they're running code on your computer. How can that possibly be safe? And frankly, it can't. That's the problem. <laughs> but even still, they use up a lot of system resources uh, because they have to be the, the whole program is run again from scratch on every request. And most of those CGI scripts are written in Perl, although you know, other languages get used to because CGI scripts, they don't care what language you use. But you'd really like something more performant. Um, and, but it still needs to meet the, 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 that key thing of being able to run in a shared environment. Popular scripting languages have plugins for Apache at this point. And so those are things like Mod Perl and Mod Python, where you can embed a copy of your scripting language interpreter in the, um, in the Apache uh, web server itself. But they aren't well suited to shared hosting. They're designed for, well, I have a web server and that's my application. And that's where we are now, but that's not where we were then. They provide, you know, they're a persistent interpreter across the requests, which you can do all kinds of things to improve your speed with. Um, but it means that they share memory. And so you really can't serve up 
software from one person and software from another. And there were attempts to make this work, but they were all pretty, uh, I wouldn't trust them. I would trust them even less than shared CGI solutions, which is really saying something. Um, and they also had the problem that they, they kept their memory routine requests. And if you've got a bunch of programmers who've been writing CGI scripts, well, they don't have to worry about memory management because all their memory goes away at the end of the request. And now you've got this thing, this, this you know, server that stays around all the time and your process gets bigger and bigger and bigger and pretty soon your servers are falling over. And then they were also finicky to get set up right. Um, even if you weren't leaking memory, they tended to use more memory than you would have been accustomed to, so you needed to put some sort of proxy on the front end, which, again, no one was really doing that yet. Um, so come, here comes along PHP. PHP 3 in particular. PHP 2 is where it first got like public visibility, and PHP 3 is where it finally took off. And it was extremely easy to set up, which is kind of a theme here. Like, that reducing friction is one of the key things to, to like making a technology adoptable. And it had the same memory model as CGI scripts, which is to say every request, it threw away all the memory the interpreter was holding. And so there was no state between requests. And that was huge. Because that meant that like, you don't have to worry, again, you don't have to worry about running out of memory. You don't have to, I mean, it means you can't like store variables between the requests, but hey, you've got MySQL for that, right? <laughs> um, and it was kind of a kitchen sink included language. Its standard library is absurdly large, especially if you do the default compile and take in all of the modules that are bundled with it. It really has everything you could possibly want to do, just built in. I mean, sometimes the names are a little weird, but they're there. And that's really nice from a posting point of view because it means that your users aren't bugging you to install modules all the time. With CGI, somebody goes, well, I need this Perl module to do this thing. And you're like, ah, we're going to have to install that. And then we're going to have to install that in any new systems we make. And no, you just can't have it. PHP, it's already there. Um, and if it's not, well, PHP didn't really have a module system in PHP 3. It could include files, essentially. So you just put the file in your directory and require it. And it's good. Um, and because it was so easy to set up, you could basically just install it with your Linux distribution, and that was it. You could do more complicated things, but you didn't have to. And because most uh, web hosting companies were small and uh, strapped for time and cash, anything that saved money was valuable. So that kind of explains like why, why it was available in the ecosystem, is that it was a cheap thing to make available and it solved people's problems. Um, but as a web developer, why do you want it? Well, you're working at a web design firm or a small business. You're not working in a large shop because large shops have their own servers and you're probably using something else, maybe Java at this point. Um, or, I don't know if ASP is out yet, maybe. Yeah, okay. Um, but you need, some, you need someone to host dynamic websites for your customers or for yourself. And um, so, first of all, it just has to be available. You have to be able to buy this service somewhere. And your choices are pretty limited. PHP is really nice because it runs so much faster than CGI because it's built into the web server because it doesn't have to go out and run another program every time you do anything. Um, and your web hosting company is way more happy to give you access to that than, well, you know, if you wrote a Mod Perl application and you're trying to get it hosted somewhere, no one does that. It's just, no. You'd have to have a dedicated server, you'd have to have sysadmins, you'd have to set all of that up yourself. Um, and another aspect of what made PHP as appealing as it was is that so many CGI-based sites at the time didn't use any templating. They just printed fragments of HTML to, to, to the output. And by the time it was done, it kind of put together a valid HTML document, or kind of valid. And, and browsers did the best they could. Um, but this was really hard to maintain, and 
nobody who, which is why everyone was writing templating libraries, is because it was terrible. And PHP said, well, we're just going to embed code in HTML. Um, and the, so the, because that was the default mode of interaction, um, this made it really easy to start with a static layout and then start adding dynamism to it. So you could have your, your graphic designer who maybe knows how to use, you know, um, one of the, uh, the site generators to put together some HTML for you. And then you can go in there and start editing that to add in, to, to make it do the things that it needs to do. Um, also made the format, made the language feel much more web native than any of the other languages. It was one of the first languages developed like specifically to support websites. And because of, it encouraged this incremental approach, it was much easier to actually get people who hadn't been programmers before to start adding dynamic content of their own. Because they looked, and they went, I can just add this little snippet and it does that thing? This is great. And so we got an entirely new generation of web developers. Like, just, just from that. Uh, it, was, it was the same visibility where you could like, just go in and view the HTML and see how it worked. You could now do that with, the, with your programming language, too. And with all the libraries that are built in, you can do almost anything you'd want to, from custom graphics to email to database access. Um, it was all there, and it was all already there. You just had to go and look for it. And it, too, had extensive web-based documentation. And it was all obviously available. Some, some of the site, like the, I was thinking about this, and some of the software at the time had pretty good documentation, but they hid it away. It wasn't like the first thing you saw on the site. Whereas with PHP, the very first thing you saw on the site at that time was the search box, which searched their documentation. And of course, because all their modules were just built into the core language, it searched all the documentation. Like, you go to, you know, Perl's documentation and you searched it at the time, it searched the core language documentation, which told you nothing about, you know, the tools you're going to use to build a website. Whereas you do that on PHP and it's like, well, here's image magic, here's, um, you know, the DB layer. And they had translations into many languages all in the same place, and they had it for, they had it across all of that documentation. Again, this is a, um, when you have a distributed, more distributed ecosystem, it's harder to get that consistency of translation, that consistency of uh, presentation. And so it was really valuable at the time. You also didn't have to worry about like requiring modules or dependency management because it was all just built in all the time. You could not have them. <laughs> and surprisingly, again, it had comments that were actually useful to people who are learning this stuff. Um, corrections to the documentation, examples, uh, question and answer sections. It all existed there and it was surprisingly helpful. So PHP, it was, it was, it was a critical, I, I mean, I think it's surprisingly impactful uh, for all the flack that it gets. It was a critical piece of the web at a specific time. So we're going on to something else. XML, which is extensible markup language. And it's a set of rules for creating markup languages like HTML. Um, it's our ugly stepchild of the web. And again, this is 1998, because apparently 1998 was a pivot year in the web. I didn't realize this before I started writing the talk, and I'm like, everything was in 1998? Apparently so, uh, you know, five-year anniversary of the web, right? Something like that, um, and uh, and that's when everything started to happen. So the web and HTML are truly taking over the world, and everyone wants to hook up their legacy data sources to the internet to share them with each other. Um, and you're writing software that integrates uh, disparate computer systems, and you need to interchange. Uh, you need an interchange format of some kind. Traditionally, either you folks would, uh, you're, either the folks you're integrating with or you would have to make up a format just on the fly and uh, then write a custom parser or importer for it. And then if you ever made any changes, well, you're probably, that was going to be a whole hassle. And 
because you know, if you did a, if you were doing like a binary file format, well, what if you need to add a field and now your old parser, your old load importer doesn't work at all? And if you're doing a text format, um, does it, does it support loading new things? What happens if you give the new data to the old program? Um, it was awkward. And we dealt with that for, you know, 40 years, 50 years. But, um, hey, there's this, you know, XML, it's made by the same folks who made HTML. It looks like HTML, but you can make up your own tags. That's like its key thing. And it's way more regular. So writing parsers for it, just generic parsers for it, it's a lot easier. And most parsers, like it's defined in the spec that you, you know, if you get an error, you error out. Which is really nice because it means that if you write your own parser, you don't have to worry about getting sloppy input. Whereas with HTML, <laughs> We have, it, we have it defined now. We'll just say that. But we didn't have it defined then. So XML was only finalized in January of 1998. But because it was so easy to parse, it was already, there were already parsers. Like By the time it was finalized, there were parsers widely available for all the popular languages. And by having this like meta file format, you can plug a standard parser into or a standard emitter into, then you can actually just talk about like the thing that you actually care about, which is your data. And you don't have to think about like how is it be, you know, you still have to think about some bits, like how am I going to serialize this date? That's not defined. It's string between tags, but still a big improvement over what we had before. Um, and hey, maybe you can finally convince those mainframe folks to stop giving you fixed width text exports. Mind you, I think that still took, you know, another decade, but. <laughs> um, it also introduced UTF-8 as the default, which probably wasn't noticed that much at the time, but having Unicode, that was where Unicode started to be everywhere. Um, and it even came with both document and stream-based parsers uh, on most platforms, and so the Document-based parsers are way easier to work with when you've got a small document. And if you've got large documents, well, stream-based parsers means that you can handle arbitrarily large data sets, way beyond the amount of memory you have. So both are necessary, and they're actually there from the start. Because of how it's designed, you can add new tags to your, to your tag format, and your old code is probably going to continue working. Um, it's always possible to write something that'll break when you extend it, but you kind of had to go out of your way with XML. And that finally allowed you to decouple the process of writing your side from process of writing the side of the person you're integrating with. And that tight coupling had been the bane of, of this kind of integrations programming for an extended period of time. And there have been a number of attempts, mind you, XML is hardly the first language to do this. Um, it's just the one that took over the web. Um, probably because it looks like HTML. So, yeah, yay XML. It saved us from the, the world of fixed width file formats and, uh, and binary file formats and like, I used a record statement in Pascal and wrote it out to disk and that's good enough. Um, you know, it, it's, it's ugly as sin but it's there for a reason. And we've got, you know, possibly better things now, but depends on what you're doing. So, moving on. Perl, near and dear to my heart. It's a, uh, it's a uh, Unix scripting language at its heart. Um, it was written by sysadmins for sysadmins. We're going to talk about specifically about Perl 5 and its introduction, which is this is 1996, and um, the web is young, and folks with dynamic websites are few and far between. Uh, well, there are some proprietary solutions available at this point. Things like uh, Netscape Server allows you to, you know, have uh, server tags in the middle of your HTML with JavaScript running in them. For instance, the very first server-side JavaScript. Um, and they, were, they weren't even the first to put scripting languages in the middle of web pages. 
But most folks are using, still using CGI scripts to power their websites where, where anyone's doing anything at all. Um, usually in small ways like form processors and things like that. But larger sites are being built too. And CGI scripts are simple. They're just an executable program uh, that get a known set of environment variables with the information about the request, and then they print out what they want sent back to the user. Um, so Perl, with its start as a sysadmin language, was widely adopted by the time the web came along. And while it wasn't a part of a standard stock install in many flavors of Unix, it was almost always added later. It was very rare to log into a Unix system that didn't have Perl. And it was a key part of every Linux distribution that I'm aware of. And the ascension of Linux started, and this was just as the ascension of Linux was starting to become more obvious uh, outside of the community that had been using it. So who are you? You're a sysadmin or systems programmer who's been asked to put together a website for your organization because you're the tech person and they don't really know anyone else to ask. And you know, you're like, well, I can figure it out. How hard could it be? Um, so you need to pick a language for your CGI scripts. Well, everyone you know knows Perl. You could write your CGI scripts in C, and certainly some folks do, but maintaining a C program is substantially more time consuming than writing a Perl program. Doubly so, because most of what CGI scripts are doing is reading and writing strings, which Perl is great at, and C is terrible at. Um, Perl is kind of built on text processing. And what's more, it's trivial to write Perl programs that are actually portable across Unix systems. And this means you can develop it on your Linux desktop and then deploy it to your Solaris server and everything still works. And that can't be said for C scripts. It can't even be said for shell scripts. Perl 5 is the new hotness. Uh, but Perl 4 is still used widely, and many installations you'll see both installed side by side. Some of the earliest web-related libraries are available for Perl 4, uh, from libwww, which was actually, um, was essentially, I think, the second web library ever written after uh, Tim Berners-Lee's C-based libwww, um, and CGI lib, which, is the, which was the Perl 4 CGI processing. So Perl 5 is even more exciting. It has excellent libraries for dealing with the web in both libwww and CGIPM. And it has the CPAN, which is this grand new experiment in sharing modules for programming languages. Uh, it started as a centralized FTP archive. And um, since these are machines that you admin, getting libraries installed is no problem. And this is actually, it was actually in this year that the, that the, C, the CPAN's been around for about a year at this point, but this is the year that the package manager for it is actually first published. So you can actually start installing things with a command. No one's done this before. Um, and the, the archive is largely uncurated. Um, there, there's a central index at this stage that, that is curated, but you can go to your author directory and upload whatever you want, and anyone can come and get it. And so we're starting to see this experimentation that we've not seen before, this sort of thing. You're, this is where you know Perl had like joke libraries. It has a whole Acme namespace full of libraries that are um, that, that are you know kind of funny, like Acme don't, which it's see, it's like the do command, except it doesn't run the code. <laughs> and it works because an apostrophe is a valid part of syntax in Perl that does not mean string when it shows up in the middle of a, a thing. So, okay. So yes, so Perl is, is a fantastic choice and it's the choice that many people make. But let's look away from the web just for a moment. Visual Basic. Visual Basic was, um, not actually breaking new ground, but it was bringing something to people that most people had never seen before. It's, it's basic for Windows, essentially, um, but it had some special features. So it's 1993. Going back further, Windows for Workgroups has been spreading like wildfire. Many small departments and large companies have been setting up their own file and print servers. NCSA Mosaic exists, but you've probably never even heard of it. 
If you're listening to Tech Hype, maybe you've heard of the web, but it's hardly a thing ordinary folks have. When you think software, uh, the only kind you think of is the kind that comes on a floppy disk you install on your computer. So you're working for a shop that previously had been writing DOS applications, but wants to get into this Windows thing. Or maybe you're an IT department worker who's finding the need for greater flexibility um, than things like spreadsheet templates and macros can provide. What you really need is an easy to use Windows application. Almost everybody who has, uh, who knows how to program knows BASIC in this world. And Visual Basic provides a bunch of quality of life enhancements to Basic. It's essentially, if you've used QBasic and DOS or Turbo Basic, they're basically the same, um, very similar. And your other option is C. And C is finicky, and it's been hard to, always been hard to teach people pointers, and it's harder to find folks who are it's just harder to find folks who are comfortable with C. And Visual Basic has that kind of, you can tinker with it until it works thing going on. And it has that because it's kind of an amazing experience. You start it up and you get a form designer. And this is your designing the new window that you want to have displayed. So you're working visually with what you need. Not really, really not unlike how HTML and the web experience work. You're directly designing what you want. And, and even better, you're not even like writing tags or code, you're just directly manipulating stuff on the screen to make it look like what you want. And then you like double click on something and it lets you enter like when this button is pressed, run this code and it pops up a little window and you type in the code you want it to run. And you can't actually see all your code at once in the early versions, but on the other hand, it means that you're never looking at more than one like small piece, so it, it forces you to keep your context tight. And while other language environments did come with form designers that looked a lot like the one that Visual Basic had, the big difference is that they were code generators. So you'd press the generate button, and then you go make changes to that code, and now you can't use the form designer anymore. Because if you do, it's just going to regenerate the code and overwrite all your changes. Later on, we'd get things that were even better that like could reflect it back and forth, but we weren't there yet. Um, and the, the code generators were generating this opaque code full of all these things that you don't know anything about because you didn't write it. So it's all this stuff that's necessary to like create a graphics context and instantiate a dialogue box and keep it open until this happens and none of which have you encountered until you press that generate button. And because Visual Basic is easy to teach, um, many community colleges at that point had already started to uh, build it into curricula. And this meant that finding new coworkers didn't always mean teaching them the language, which in many places in the country at that time, any time you hired, you had to teach them whatever language you used in-house. So the idea that you wouldn't have to teach somebody the language that you were using was really appealing. So Visual Basic definitely had its place, and having that kind of back and forth, you know, um, you can keep editing your form and edit your code, like, that, I think that was kind of perfected with Delphi, because with Delphi you could actually, like, it would essentially generate the code, then you could edit the generated code and go back to the form designer and it would take the edits. It was completely magic. It also had a lot less cruft, because they wrote the language specifically for the graphical environment, but this isn't about Delphi. This is several years before Delphi is a thing. So, Visual Basic. We're gonna move on to Tickle TK. You may never have heard of Tickle TK, unless you're of a certain age. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm including it because if you have heard of it, it's probably been grousing. And I've done my share, so this is kind of my penance. Tickle is a string-centered scripting language, um, although kind of not in the way that Perl is. 
like in Tickle, literally everything is a string, and then it just kind of pretends they aren't. So like even the arrays are conceptually implemented internally as strings. It's kind of weird, but it works. <laughs> but what it was designed to be was easy to embed. Um, and no other language at the time was easy to embed. But it, was, it was really trivial to take a C program that you'd written and go, I want a scripting language built into my C program. And then you could just compile and tickle, and there it is. And in, in its heyday, this is really what set it apart from everything else. These days, uh, Lua has largely taken on that role. But, um, and the, so the other part there is the TK, and that's the GUI library. We're coming back to that. So when was the Tickle TK heyday? Early to mid 90s, maybe later 90s. And you'd use it because you're in the need of a cross-platform GUI environment. Or you're a web developer looking to do best-in-class web server integration. And weirdly, Tickle is kind of where it's at for that for a little while. Um, or maybe your router runs Tickle programs. Stranger things have happened. <laughs> like that whole, like, you can embed it means it showed up everywhere. And it had much smaller runtime and a faster startup times than that new upstart Java. And uh, so Tickle TK was one of the few good options for writing truly cross-platform GUI apps. Programs written in Tickle TK can run on fancy SGI workstations, Solaris desktops, Macintosh computers, and PCs with Linux and Windows. And so that was unheard of. Well, the user interface really only looked home, looked at home in the, the early versions of Tickle TK. It really only looked home on Unix and Linux machines, particularly ones using Motif. Um, it did eventually add native widgets, and it was more like using a native app. It never, it, they never really achieved that. But your program could run everywhere, so that was something. And you didn't have any other choice, so you used it. <laughs> so as a web developer, why would you use it as a web developer? Well, you want to create a highly performant database-backed website, and you want the state of the art, you want to be able to talk to an Oracle database and not have those you know, multi-second latencies? Well, you'd use NaviServer, which is later renamed to AOL Server, because you know AOL has possibly the worst naming in the world, and also because apparently all APIs have to be prefixed with NS. It's just one of the laws, because you've got NaviServer, and then Mozilla has NS for Netscape, and then, um, then of course, OS X has NS for Next Step. So everyone's NS. Um, so, yes, with the exp with expensive database connections, it was extremely valuable. Ooh, I missed a slide. Excellent. Um, this is because it's a multi it's a multi threading server. It's persistent, like the much later things like Mod Perl and Mod Python. So it can actually it has connection pooling built in. So you can have your database connections, and they can be there, and you pull them out of the pool when you need them. And it had these in, like, 1994, um, which is basically unheard of at that, at that stage of the game. And there was some impressive software written on it later on, but it was all in Tickle. Um, and it just slowly fell out. It never, it never managed to catch on, in part because NaviServer was proprietary all the way up until 1999. Um, so it missed its window, because by then, people were using PHP and MySQL, and no one wanted to talk about Oracle licenses or setting up their own servers or anything else. So anyway, Tickle TK, it was a thing. Kind of, that's kind of the, the summation of the talks. Uh, they were things. They were great. We've come a long way, and uh, our technology is getting better. Um, I, will, I, I am always happy with the, the current state of our technology stack. It's so much better than it was five years ago, and five years before that, and five years before that. Let me tell you, I can go on for a while. So thank you all for joining me in my historical boosterism. Um, <laughs> If you're curious about what the genesis of the talk was, come say hi in the hall. I'd be happy to talk to you about it. Or if you've got your own favorite talk down tech to talk up, 
I love hearing those stories too. That's all. <laughs>